Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Weekly Waypoint. Today we are playing Diablo 4 Season 3 on my brand new Bow Rogue. I'm not super duper far into Diablo 4 Season 3, but I am far in enough to know that this is going to be the season that I spend the most amount of time in so far. In fact, it has already become the season that I've spent the most amount of time in so far. It's a very low bar to cross, but I really like the story so far with that, um, is he called Ayazan guy? It's been a few days since I've really done story things, but I get the impression that general reception to the season is less than great. People seem to hate the vaults. However, the only kind of feedback I've had about Diablo for season three is from notifications from Reddit, where it logged me out long ago, won't let me log back in, and now has decided to send me random notifications from subreddits that I have visited. And I made the mistake of visiting the Diablo 4 subreddit again. So now while I'm happily plodding along in Season 3 and having a fun time, every day, at least once a day, I get a notification from Reddit being like, Hey, do you want, do you want to see this person telling you how much they hate Season 3 and how much the game sucks and how much they're never going to play it again? And yeah, I don't know, maybe some of the design is flawed, I really haven't got that far yet. Maybe I will get super sick of the vaults. My main complaint so far has has just been with a Diablo 4 base game because once again I'm getting up there in level and I am feeling less powerful as I level which is the problem I had with the main game too. Ultimately I think I'll find it hard to take complaints about the content of Diablo 4 seasons too seriously because I come from Diablo 3 where the content of every single season in that game pretty much apart from the last few was just just play the game again lol and we did and we did do that this time around there's plot and new game mechanics and new areas and new things to do and i'm like hey that's pretty cool isn't it but i guess obviously if the quality of those things is inherently low that's not gonna feel great i just haven't got to that point yet part of me does wonder though if the because i know seasons one and two were apparently lackluster as well again no this is all coming from reddit so <laughs> Who fucking knows if that's actually true? My theory is that maybe these are people who stuck with a game during its lowest moments for too long and are now just burnt out on the game because I, the, the reason I'm having fun with it is that I haven't really touched it since Season 1 came out. So I'm just having fun playing Diablo 4. Oh, by the way, I don't know why the texture for those stairs wasn't loading. But yeah, I'm just having fun playing Diablo 4 and everyone else, I guess, has been trying to like make themselves enjoy the game for like a year or whatever. It hasn't been a year, but for the first two seasons at this point, I'm probably sick to death of it. This is the main thing I noticed when I first came back to the game. Like, oh, the base gameplay is inherently fun. I was just burnt out on it when I stopped playing. Oh, God damn it! I'm so sorry. If you thought my voice sounded a little bit lower quality than normal, uh, it's because I recently downloaded a program called Voice Mod and it was piping it through that, which means, yeah, sorry about that. In the news this week for video games, PAL World released, and I know you're already sick of hearing about it because I know I am. Uh, welcome to the section of a show which I'm going to call Christian is a Grumpy Old Man. We're not going to do the whole thing about is it AI, is it plagiarism, that's already been done to death and there's still no definitive answers, so we're just going to skip right over that bit. I didn't know this game was going to be such a huge hit. Before I did, I downloaded it and tried it for myself, and um, I stopped playing early access survival games long ago. And I didn't know that Pal World was going to come with survival game elements. I knew it was going to be like, oh, you know, it's like a Pokemon ripoff and you shoot, shoot them instead and it's different that way. Um, but I didn't realise it was going to be a survival game, and I'm not going to lie, that immediately put me off of it quite quickly. There are some survival games I like, but just... Early access survival crafting games, just, I just, you know, I did a lot of them back in the day, and I'm off that stuff now, I'm good. The second it told me to craft a workbench, my heart sank. <laughs> but also just the early access, uh, kind of like, unrefined version of a game, you know, that's also something I'm sick of dealing with, so like, you load it up and your right stick sensitivity is all the way down to one by default for some reason, and then, um, you know, the sound effects are already crunchy and temporary, and... It's just like, I would rather play this game when it comes out. I will give it another go when it comes out, like, full release. But there's just so much about that game that is just crunchy, and I'm, I'm not about that right now. Not when there are so many fantastic, complete, finished experiences for me to go and play. Now for the Grumpy Old Man part. That wasn't the Grumpy Old Man part? No, it was not. Pokemon fans have been pretty upset by this game, and I don't want to join the camp of uh, someone in a fan base who is upset by a game that is uh, taking inspiration from that game. Uh, and doing different things with it, but, uh, but, okay, before I get started, I will say, this purely comes from, I've just heard a bunch of people talking about this game in a way that, like, oh, it does things that really mixes up the formula, which Pokemon hasn't done in ages, and, um, 
I have two things to say on that front. Firstly, if your notion of Pokemon for adults is, uh, it's great because now it has guns and you can shoot the Pokemon. If that's your notion of Pokemon for adults, I have to say that's a pretty depressing notion of Pokemon for adults. Uh, uh, you know, and this goes against some of the, I would say, plagiarism things. I think Pal World is a completely different game from what I've seen to Pokemon. Like, obviously it has pals. It has, like, the idea of collecting and capturing these different... You know, it is a... Um, uh, there is a name for the genre. What is it again? A monster taming. Uh, it is a par partially a monster taming game. And that's fine. But there's so much else that makes up Pokemon uh, that's not here. I don't see why Pokemon for adults would have to be like edgy as well and be like, ooh, in this game you have guns and you can shoot a Pokemon. That makes it for adult. Like, you can still have like wholesome, cute content and for it to be for adults, you know, but yeah, whatever. And the second thing I have to say is for fuck's sake, <laughs> play Pokemon Legends Arceus. <laughs> it's not a perfect game, especially visually, but Pokemon Legends Arceus, in my opinion, is Pokemon for adults. It's still all ages, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think it's designed with older players in mind, and I really hope they don't give up on the Pokemon Legends series because it is honestly my favourite Pokemon game in a long time. Also, to go against the argument of Pokemon just never mixed up the formula, um, Scarlet and Violet does mix up the formula quite dramatically. Not in a way that I particularly enjoyed, um, and not in a way that I was able to continue uh, trying out because good, good lord the frame rate and the other issues that game has in performance just drove me away from it but that's another story but yeah I can see how people who haven't played Pokemon in years and years and years might feel that way when it comes to Pal World I would just say your opinions kind of come across as outdated and that might be why Pokemon fans are a little bit annoyed but yeah Pal World and Pokemon two very different games and of course um there's no harm in comparing the two. Obviously, you're going to compare the two. The, the pals look like Pokemon. It's going to happen, but um, I just had to get that off my chest. Moving on, I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, because we're already pretty deep into the video and it's a pretty depressing topic, but uh, the Xbox, Microsoft, Activision, there's too many company names now. They're all slammed together, uh, but the layoffs, the 1,900 job layoffs fucking sucks, and obviously Riot had layoffs recently as well. And um, I think I saw on Good Vibes Gaming they mentioned that we've already had half the amount of layoffs that 2023 had and we are in January and 2023 was a record year for layoffs in the tech industry. You won't be surprised to hear my thoughts. I think the CEOs and executives should be taking the pay cuts to try and keep the staff on board. I don't think that cutting staff is a reasonable way to say that you are growing the company. Obviously, we do not have all of the math for all of the finances to be able to throw it back in their faces and say, hey, look. Uh, by the way, the cut there was because I had to go AFK in the middle of a boss fight and had to stand still and die, so I'm doing it again. But yeah, a company that's just uh, passed the three trillion dollar threshold, uh, deciding to cut 1,900 jobs because, you know, they're just a small business. They have to do this so that they can grow. This is a very difficult decision for everyone. I will read out one thing, which I think is kind of a smoking gun. In Phil Spencer's statement about this, he mentioned, if I can get into the right tab, quote, we will provide our full support to those who are impacted during the transition, including severance benefits informed by local employment laws. My guy, if you are going to do severance benefits, why are they informed by the local employment laws unless you are going for the minimum possible benefits that you can get away with? There are no laws telling you you can only give a certain amount of benefits. There are plenty of laws telling you that you have to give this minimum amount of benefits. I think that one sentence is the biggest smoking gun in his entire statement. I think it really shows how, just how they do value their employees, but hey, that's just me. And if anyone's considering telling me about the harsh realities of running a business, it's not going to land on me. You don't have to try. In other news, I got caught up on Freer and the anime I talked about at length last week, and I am now uh, in the camp of waiting for Freer and Fridays. And so I cast around me for something else to watch. And do you remember last week how I was talking about how I was going to start taking notes because... I kept forgetting about things which would have been worth talking about. Well, that's because in episode 299, I completely forgot to talk about how I am watching a reality TV show, which is not the kind of genre I typically enjoy watching. No shade to people who do. I'm just, you know, quite introverted. I don't really, um, what's the word? I guess I just don't vibe with those shows would be the easiest way of putting it. But I've been watching Traitors season one and two, and no, I will not be giving any spoilers if you are not caught up, if you are also watching those shows or are planning to in the future. But for those of you who don't know, Traitors is a show where 24, 22, around that many people enter a mansion, 
um, and three or four of them get chosen to be traitors and they have to complete various tasks as a team to add money to the money pot at the end and at the end if there is a traitor among them and they all decide to end the game uh, the traitor gets all of the money. There are also nightly Danganronpa style like round table arguments about who is or is not the traitor and uh, almost every night they get the traitors meet up and choose to murder a particular contestant that's pretty much the world so there's still some you know intricacies but it doesn't really matter it's a deception game and there's some stuff that even even as i love a show and i'm addicted to it there's still some things in my brain which is like is it really cool to put humans through this and point at them on a screen and laugh at them for being wrong when they've just like been through an emotional fucking roller coaster and you know lost a bunch of money or whatever i have lots of issues with reality shows uh and you know not all of them were present here but also some of them still were that being said i did manage to mostly to turn that part of my brain off for once and just enjoy the show it was fucking it's absolutely riveting and fascinating watching these human beings you know some of them think they're so clever and they always get everything wrong some of them think they're complete idiots and they're always throwing out theories which are actually surprisingly correct seeing how the entire group will turn on you know one person after one tiny thing gets mentioned and then they're all completely wrong and you know how traitors may or may not orchestrate those events in the first place I honestly recommend watching it. It's like um, a, a legitimately interesting show. And it's not all just drama and arguments. There's a lot of like wholesome moments. There's a lot of funny moments. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. I just finished watching season two yesterday. And, you know, I don't think this is going to be my gateway drug into other reality TV shows. I'm still not really that interested in any of them. But it does remind me of, uh, you know, it's a completely different type of show. But it does remind me of when I was little watching Big Brother. And, um, you know, getting to know these random people. And, you know, seeing who would leave and that kind of thing. I did see on iPlayer that there's an Australian version, which I may check out but for now i think i've had my fill so yeah as for what i've been playing this week it's not been anything new uh it's been more final fantasy 14 it's been more final fantasy 2 it's been more diablo 4 which i've already talked about in terms of final fantasy 14 i just finally got one of your reputations to max i finished the kojin i got my is it a spoiler to tell you what you get for finishing it, it you, you probably know, you probably know what you get, you get a mount and it's a pretty cool mount. I feel like I'm really making some good progress in that game right now in terms of like, you know, I've got a spreadsheet with like reputations and custom deliveries and like raids and stuff, you know, just like, it's a pretty simple checklist spreadsheet but uh, it shows me a bunch of the stuff that I should be focusing on as a mostly max level player who gets distracted just mindlessly leveling alt jobs. And yeah, I feel like I've been making good progress in that game, finishing up stuff. I did the uh, Sky Pirates raid recently. Um, I finished the Air Hill 2 custom deliveries recently. Not only that, uh, but recently, it wasn't this week, it might have been a week or two ago now, uh, but I did hit 90 on Red Mage, which was my third max job on Tamara Seraphon. And I'm getting up there on Carpenter as well. I, I guess if we're counting uh, crafting and gathering jobs, it would be my fifth carpentry would be my fifth max level i've got botanist up as well but yeah god the amount of i know i've probably said this before but the amount of content in final fantasy 14 got like five ten years ago i was so focused on finding a forever game and i wanted everything to be a forever game i think this was a fairly common trend back then but i would look at games at the lens through the lens of like how long is this game how much content does it have how long is it going to keep me occupied for I think honestly Game Pass has beaten some of that out of me because I've got to experience some shorter games and realised how fulfilling they are. But I feel like, you know, I, it would be nice to be able to send a message back in time and be like, Final Fantasy XIV is your forever game. Like, I mean, I have a few forever games, you know me, I rotate through these different games. I will, in a few months, I will not care about Final Fantasy XIV. I will be bored with it, but right now it's my entire life, <laughs> kind of. And um I'm having a really good, really good time with it, and there is just so much content. Like, I've put so many hundreds of hours into that game, and there are still so many things I know, like, nothing about. Like, full entire game systems, which themselves will be tens of hours at least. Um, like, Eureka and Boja and stuff. Also, um, I'm hoping next month to pick up the first uh, book of the... Oh, what's it called? The Encyclopedia Eorzea. I've kind of held off. I've, I've known this book existed for a while, but I've held off on grabbing it. Uh, because it's this one first volume was written during like a run reborn in heavensward and the devs themselves have said that they you know wrote most of the game's lore kind of like around heavensward or after so i was worried it would feel outdated but i've asked some people about it and they say it doesn't 
And also, what's really put me onto it at the minute is the Shadow of Mahak uh, and those raids, the Sky Pirates raids even. And, like, just seeing, like, oh, there's still so much lore I don't know about. Even having finished the MSQ, there is still so much lore. Like, I know almost nothing about most of the world's history, especially in comparison to, like, games like, you know, World of Warcraft and stuff. And I don't know if the Encyclopedia A or Z will really delve too much into history, but I've just heard that, you know, we're on Volume 3 now, it's a great read. Um, it is, like, 35 to 40 pounds, which is, like, almost double the price of how much those kinds of books usually go for, but I imagine part of that is translation costs. But there's no games coming out uh, that I think I'm gonna really be dropping lots of money on for the next few months. Like, Persona 3 Reload, I'm super excited for that. Oh my god, that'll be out by the time of the next weekly waypoint, won't it? But that's on Game Pass, so I don't have to worry about that. Also, I should mention that Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth uh, just came out, which is the sequel to Yakuza Like a Dragon. I still haven't finished that original game uh, due to that, um, as I've already mentioned, the pacing issues with leveling up uh, and that massive level spike during Chapter 12 due to me, I guess, not having played enough side content as I played through the game. Really kind of killed my interest, uh, but I am still really intrigued in how that story ends, so I will get back to it one day. But also, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is not on Game Pass, and um, as I've also already mentioned in an earlier weekly waypoint, the series producer or whatever kind of made some very offhanded comments about, oh yeah, we just put it on Game Pass as like a business card thing, which very much kind of put a sour taste in my mouth. I'm like, okay, dude, but hey... Um, so yeah, I probably won't be playing Infinite Wealth anytime soon, but um, hopefully I will one day. This year seems to be a very strong one for RPGs in general, which is exciting to me because I intend to spend this year playing through older RPGs if I'm being perfectly honest. Obviously I'm still making my way through Final Fantasy 2, I will probably pause during my Pixel Remaster jaunt when uh, Persona 3 comes out, but you know. Even though I have uh, met the pain points of Final Fantasy 2, I'm still having a fun time playing through it, so I will finish it. And that's going to do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you watched all the way through. These particular videos have a pretty awful audience retention time, which I wish I had not looked at. Um, so yeah, leave a like if you enjoyed the video. It means a lot to me, and I will see you in whatever I make next.